day. Welcome to Freer Talk Live. We do this every now and then, usually once a week. This week, though, we did it twice because we were also, uh, Rich Paul and I did one on Friday night. Uh, here on internet only platforms like uh, D Live and Twitch, which is where you're watching us right now, if you are watching. Uh, and so, Mark, you actually called this. Let me turn off the. We're back in a moment because we're now back. Uh, you called this episode a special episode here of Free yeah. Talk Live because you wanted to uh, interview Danny Ladane. And for our listeners who aren't familiar, yeah. So, welcome to the after show, Mark. You don't do these very often. No. Um, you got a family and shit. Well, did you just cuss? Yeah, it's the after show. You can say whatever the fuck you want to say here. Uh, right. So the purpose of the interview is that, uh, you know, I mean, I think we've got the most morally sound, logically consistent philosophy that one can find out there. Mm -hmm. Now, people tend to be pretty bad at looking at their own beliefs critically. Yes. And... The only way I'm going to find out if I'm wrong is by interviewing people who, at the very least, can understand where I'm coming from. That helps. And uh, and so somebody who was a libertarian right. should be able to do that. Right. Or And we uh, have him, by the way, now, uh, Danny Ladane. Are you there on the phones? Yeah, happy to be here. Sure. So what I was just telling Mark was uh, that, you know, for listeners that don't know, you're the producer of Playing Columbine, and I'm sure you've produced other things since then, but we don't necessarily know what they are because you are a filmmaker, and I know you've taught some uh, some film at some colleges, if I'm not mistaken. Can you kind of catch us up on the last decade uh, or so since since we've had you on? Yeah, sure. Um, so I seem to join your show every few years, and we kind of touch base. We first talked, of course, when I created a video game in 2005 about the Columbine school shooting called Super Columbine Massacre RPG. And then in 2007, I interviewed you guys for that film that I made called Playing Columbine. Mm -hmm. And we kind of stayed in touch. We debated Jack Thompson about video game violence. Oh, wow. That's um, right. <laughs> yeah, I forgot about, about that asshole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then in um, 2015, I talked to you guys about how I was banned from my former employer, my campus, Adams State University. That's right. um, I ended up suing the, uh, the school through the uh, um, ACLU of Colorado. They represented me in a lawsuit. Did you win? And we were able, yeah, we were able to settle the case. They paid us $100,000, and they lifted the ban on the, uh, the, the totally warrantless and um, without due process measure to remove me from campus because I was publishing information critical of the school at watchingadams.org. So that was the last time we spoke. Right on. How much did the attorneys take of the 100000 uh, the standard cut, they got 35% not and I bad. got 65%. That's not nice. bad. That helps pay the school loans off, I imagine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I was happy to uh, donate to the ACLU because they offered, yeah. you know, pro bono legal services. And they do good work. I think we, yeah, we, we did amazing work together and I was really happy with them. So long story short, because of that and at least one other lawsuit I've been a part of to preserve uh, public lands here in the San Luis Valley for agriculture called Keep Pulsed in Public. Um, I've decided to go to law school, so starting oh, wow. this fall, I will be I will be starting law school. Cool. What uh, what area of law are you planning on looking at or studying? Yeah, I'm interested in intellectual property, technology, and media communication law. The areas that have kind of interested me as a as a media maker myself. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the direction that I want to pursue. So what I was telling Mark earlier was I never knew that you had ever described as a libertarian, and Mark insists that, uh, that you Well, had. I'm not sure that he described that way, but I'm saying what I'm claiming is, is that he was a Ron Paul supporter and that he had uh, sort of uh, you know, similar ideas on the Second Amendment. So um, Is I'm that all true, Danny? Yeah, I actually kind of put together a brief timeline. The first election I voted in was in the year 2000, which was a disaster, as we all remember, right? The Bush mm -hmm. v. Gore decision, all of that, the hanging chads. Yes, that's um, the one. I, yeah, I, I actually voted for the libertarian candidate, Harry Brown, yeah, in that choice. election. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, There's never been a good then, libertarian candidate since Harry Brown. Yeah. <laughs> And in the, you know, in the decade to follow, um, I voted for John Kerry. I voted for Barack Obama. Um, but then by 2012, I felt like Obama had let me down on a number of really key issues for me, including, of course, military um, and the wars that were still ongoing. Mm -hmm. So I did register as a Republican in 2012 so that I could caucus for Ron Paul ah, okay. uh, in the 2012 election. Yeah. 
And then in 2016, I, you know, I was a Bernie Sanders supporter, but uh, I held my nose and voted for Hillary Clinton. My God. (laughs) Well, what are you going to do? I mean, you know. Uh, I don't think I would. I do vote for Daryl Perry in that election, I think. Right. Well, I mean, it's not like there were good, there were like there were a bunch of choices right. that were out there. And I don't tend to hold people's uh, feet to the fire on their presidential choices. Statistically, your chances of winning, uh, your, your vote mattering in that um, election are very, very low. So if you choose to vote for Donald Duck, then fine. If you choose to vote for the lesser of two evils because you think the other one is a terrible choice. And vermin Supreme. Whatever. Um, <laughs> you know, Vermin Supreme's a, a fine choice if, if, if you want to write him in. But, I, I, you know, I mean, having uh, traded off my votes in the past to get somebody to vote for uh, down ticket folks, I don't, uh, you know, you're not going to find me uh, scolding anyone. Yeah, no, absolutely not. So, I mean, would you say you were a libertarian at some point in the past? I think a a lowercase l libertarian Mm -hmm. would describe me. I was never registered with the Libertarian Party, although I liked aspects of Gary Johnson and all that. But yeah, I think I think lowercase libertarian or classical liberalism were interesting ideas to me for quite a while, and in some ways still are. I'm not going to say they aren't. Did that change for you in some way, though? Yeah. um, So so I kind of tried to figure out how this happened. I mean, it started with me, you know, I made a controversial video game. And so I was thrust into the debate about free speech and the Mm. First Amendment. Um, And so there were a lot of positions about, you know, legalizing drug use, sex work, um, you know, all the things that I think consenting adults should be able to do. I still believe those things. Um, for sure. And then, of course, we had the, the financial crisis of 2008. And so issues like, you know, hard currencies and the critique of fiat money, those things really resonated with me, certainly. Um, and so that, that was kind of the, how the evolution started. Um, but I, I think I just had a difficult time when I would go out and make what I thought were strong libertarian arguments. Um, I sometimes had a difficult time actually generating examples of where I thought the ideas that I was championing were succeeding. Yeah. And I also, you know, I came, I came upon some pretty difficult questions like, well, you know, I'm a, I'm a product of the public school system. I was teaching at a state university at sure. the time. Um, and there are a lot of things that I think that, that the state can actually do fairly well. I think it could do them better, um, but I, I looked at the alternative and I thought, well, what would what would this kind of minarchist society or this society of you know completely voluntary exchanges look like? Um, and it was really difficult to conceive at any grand scale. You know, it might work in a very small um, situation, but that always seemed to be nested within a larger structure where the court system would be enforced, where the police or the fire department would show up, where you could get an ambulance to a hospital and receive care regardless of your ability to pay. Those were the kinds of things that I I ran into when I was caucusing for Ron Paul and trying to convince more of my left-leaning friends that Ron Paul had a lot of great ideas. And I think he did have some good ideas. Um, But there were some other sticking points that, yeah, you know, that that was a little difficult to defend. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I would say that if you have a difficult time defending a particular issue, then you probably should be prepared to change your mind. However, um, when I think about, you know, government school, for instance, I, I think for one, you were working at a, a you know, a, a university, right? So right, you're, yeah. mm-hmm. you're, you're boiling away in a, uh, you know, a godless commie uh, cauldron, right? And, and uh, that makes it difficult to, I mean... If you, if you don't have other people around you that believe like you believe, it's really hard to hold on to those opinions. But when well, you if s- I could just point out very quickly, yeah. Mark, that yeah, sure. unfortunately, higher education in the United States is really moving in the opposite direction of communism because students are actually burdened with more and more of the tuition oh, yeah. dollars that they pay. Yes. And we can talk about that in detail, but I want to talk I, about I'm that. just going to take issue with the idea that we were living in this communist utopia in the ivory tower. Well, I mean, would you, would you, but you, would you agree that most, most, many, all, or very few of, I mean, you, you tell me, uh, how, how many of your professors that you spoke to on a regular basis would have uh, had similar ideas to you, and how many were just sort of, uh, you know, lefty liberals? I mean, I have no problem stating that most um, most faculty in higher education are left-leaning, democratic, yeah. 
you know, progressive people. There's, that's not really up for debate. Unless you go in the school of business where you find most of the Republicans or most of the conservatives, yeah. you know, most people in, in higher ed are liberal. And there are a lot of reasons why. We could talk about why you start out as liberal so you like more education or you get more education so you become more liberal. It's kind of a feedback loop. But yeah, I, yeah, I agree with that. So um, I think that you know, for one, let me let me give a little here first, because I think it's important to do so. I think that this modern generation of uh, college going uh, you know, people, probably the, the ones that have already graduated and are sitting out there with tens of thousands of dollars of debt and useless degrees, degrees. hundred thousand dollars, sometimes right, more. Yeah, right. A hundred thousand dollars. So let's just use that number. It's nice and round. A uh, hundred thousand dollars in uh, debt on a degree that they're not going to use should probably be offered a bailout in the same way that banks that were responsible for an economic mount, meltdown, uh, you know, 2006, 7, 8, wherever you want to call it. And, uh, you know, the re resulting, uh, you know, real estate crisis and all that stuff. They got bailed out because they were too important. I'd say our future is important. And to throw uh, millennials uh, out with the, you know, the babies out with the ba bathwater because we sold them a bill of goods that a communications degree for $100,000 was a good idea that somehow they've just got to live with that. These are young people and they're impressionable. And you take them and you throw them in a state system where they're told over and over and over and over again that if you want to be successful you have to go to college and then in order to get to college they have to sign their uh, on a dotted line these are people not old enough to drink according to the government uh, that they can then take out a hundred thousand dollars in debt that they don't really see the future of having to pay yeah those people i think need a bailout from the government and that's because the government did a bad thing to them in the first place However, yeah, I, um, I think I think at least some of that is is certainly true. I mean, we're we're right now on the weekend that uh, that a, a very wealthy billionaire uh, spoke at Morehouse College, I believe, and he announced that he was going to pay for all the debt of that year's graduating class, Impressive. Um, which was a very nice thing for a, a private wealthy billionaire to do. But I think it it left most of us scratching our heads as to why we're wanting the billionaires to save us rather than trying to develop a system that could actually um, equitably hand education <laughs> to people without a mountain of debt like our parents or grandparents could have done. Yeah, let's steal, uh, let's no steal the money do. from the billionaires rather than have them give it up, uh, uh, you know, voluntarily. <laughs> Um, well, we have to ask how they got those billions, Mark, but we can talk about that. It's a great that. question. So uh, let, me, let me first make my st statement about uh, education. Okay, I would say this. Some rich people got their money through graft and corruption and things like that. Those people I don't support in any way. Some got their money by, you know, making deals that people wanted and, you know, making people's lives better. Uh, Steve Jobs, this guy who you know, provided an iPhone to so many people. Awesome guy, did awesome things. Probably wasn't involved in the government much at all. However, um, you know, Elon Musk, for instance, hasn't seen a government contract that he didn't love. Um, not so much. Anyway, um, as far as the government school system goes, I mean, you know, public education, we can see, is demonstrably not as good as private education, right? I, I don't think that's actually true, okay. uh, and we can talk about why that is, Let's but I that. think, uh, you know, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that private schools have the luxury of choosing their students, and so they have outcomes that are superior in part because they pick students that are already um, in better situations to begin with. Yeah, like situations like wanting to go to school. Right. I mean, if we can talk about what it means to want to go to school and why and the model under which we develop that. But, you know, we, we've looked a lot at things like charter and magnet schools and what they do well, what they don't do well. Um, there really isn't a magic bullet. It's not like every charter school is fantastic no. and every public school is terrible. Well, what about but this turns statement? Out, but, well, what okay, about this statement that, um, that for the grade – in a, and for the jurisdiction, whatever the, the jurisdiction is that that school applies to, um, you know, all the schools in that, that 99 point, 99% of uh, the worst schools in America for a given grade and for a given jurisdiction are government-run schools. I'm not talking about charter schools. I'm talking about government-run schools. And that's just a, that's not a statistic. That's me making crap up as I go. Yeah. Uh, 
Um, so I will tell you I'm comfortable with that characterization, though we can disagree on the math. Okay. And I'll tell you that the reason for that is because, yeah, the government school is in some ways the failsafe for all the people who couldn't afford to go to school otherwise, who 100 years ago would have gotten a fifth grade education at best before they spent a life working in the mines or working in the factory or working yep. on the farm. Now, I will say, as I've talked about kind of at the outset, one of the reasons I ran up against difficulties with my libertarian arguments is if you look at the best school systems in the world, none of them are run in a kind of privatized for-profit model. Yep. The best school systems in the world pay teachers very well. They're public schools. They invest in education. They all have a master's degree or better. I'm thinking of a country like Finland. Um, and they have, you know, a 10 to 1 or less student-teacher ratio so that the teacher can really individualize the learning assessments of each student. So well, some we're of those close things can that. be replicated in a private system, um, but is that private system scalable for a country of 325 million people? Hard to say. It hasn't really borne itself out. Well, yeah. it couldn't possibly because well, it's being uh, undercut by the fact that governments steal thousands of dollars from parents, and many of them feel like they couldn't possibly afford to not only pay whatever property tax they're paying, but then on top of that also send their kids to a private school. So it's hard to say. But I, I do know that those people who've been to private school, a lot of them, uh, for instance, there's one called the Sudbury system here in New England. I don't know how far across the country it's it's spread, but uh, where the, the students actually basically run, yeah. uh, they run the school. They decide who to hire. They decide, you know, who to, you know as far as teachers, even the janitor, uh, the, the kids make the, make the decisions. They kind of go into a room all ages together in the same place. Uh, it's not this sort of regimented, you must be with people your own age kind of uh, Prussian school model system. And the kids, the not kids, but the adults who've been through that system that I know just absolutely loved it, uh, where they kind of, it was almost like unschooling, but in a schoolhouse, basically, with a bunch of other kids that were also unschooled, meaning they could kind of select their own curriculum for themselves and follow whatever, you know, whatever their calling was, which I just, I think yeah. that, you know, anything that brings yeah. more freedom to education, that's what I support. That's my real objection to the government schools is, of course, the coercion that's behind them. How do you feel about that? Well, I mean, I can speak on a number of levels here. First of all, I was growing up a gifted and talented student in a school system that was under-resourced. Yeah. So I didn't get the kind of education that, frankly, I could have gotten until about high school when I had some really excellent teachers and some additional resources that allowed me to go on to be a filmmaker and things like that. Um, let me go back just a second, because I'm actually not here to defend the status quo of the American school system as such, right? So I, I think we can all agree that, that the system that we have now is certainly not ideal, and it can certainly be improved. We could talk about why. Um, I, I would just side with Ian quickly to say that, yet yeah, the government not only, quote, steals, and we can talk about what taxation is theft means, but they, they not only steal money from the parents, but they actually also steal money from all the non-parents who don't yeah. have kids, right, who, who, are, who are part of this thing called society, and what does it mean when you don't have kids, and is it, is it worthwhile to have uh, your neighbor's kids go to school on at least your partial dime? Um, but I, I would only circle back again to say what we understand works about education really occurs more at the classroom level and individualizing education and really not at the level of how that school district is funded per se, because we have great public education in some parts of the country and it's poor in other parts. There are plenty of private schools, dare I say, some of the for-profit higher education programs that have actually been shut down yeah. because they're so terrible. Yes. I mean, Trump University comes to mind, but there are many well, others, right? There's a few of them out there, um, no doubt. I, you're not going to get my argument. These people offering these crap MBAs uh, out there that uh, you know that you know take this online course and you know that kind of thing. Well, there's or, also fly-by-night uh, operations that uh, will form, get people to you know join their college and then you know, fold and just walk away with the money. To so, me, the, the biggest yeah. problem there is the notion that uh, you know a college degree is for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, and when I would say that it's well. You know, it's not exclusive if everybody's got access to it. And, yeah. um, I, you know, I mean, this I, is a bigger this is a bigger question. Like, sure. what is the purpose of education? Are we vocationally training people to go out and perform a function in the marketplace? Yeah. Are we are we training, you know, the future citizens to go out and run the government because they're independently thinking uh, people who can 
can who can you know run their own lives and and critically evaluate claims that political leaders and and business leaders make. Um, I just want to make a macro point here, which is to say that. Uh, one of the consistent themes we've seen, and I distinguish Republicans from libertarians on this one, the Republican Party has, has for decades played this game where they defund a public program or, or uh, uh, a service, and then when that program is defunded, it starts to falter, it doesn't work well, and then they will say, oh, you see, the government see? just doesn't work well at anything, we should just eliminate it, right? Yeah. It was like, well, if you look at why this is happening, the, the, it's not always like this way, like we used to have a highway and uh, and um, and bridge system and infrastructure that was the envy of the world, right? It used to be something we invested in, and we used to have a fantastic infrastructure. And if you look at like this is what Ralph Nader says, among other people. I mean, look at who won World War II, right? The United States won World War II. Germany lost World War II. Well, look at Germany now. Look at their highway system. Look at their pension plans. Look at their education system. Look at their health care. Look at their investment in uh, in green energy technology. You'd think that they won World War II and the United States lost just by how bombed out parts of the United States look from decades of neglecting infrastructure investments. Do you think that might be done in part by uh, uh, sort of a racial bias, whether people admit it or not, that, um, you know, giving the government control over these aspects um, result today in people who are ethnically disadvantaged? And mind you, Danny, you could be ethnically disadvantaged, uh, you know, in the you know relatively near future. America's demographics are changing, but um, well, today all right, Mark, I just found out recently that uh, according to Ancestry.com, I uh, I am actually a lot more Jewish than I thought. So I don't know if I'm, I'm sorry a minority for or not. You. For that, uh, what's your percentage? Mine's ten. 10 oh, uh, my percentage of Judaism is around fifty-five percent. I am. Wow, that's really good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> how? But how much Neanderthal do you have? Oof, I, I don't know. I don't think it goes back that far. I am European in, in ancestry, but wait, wait a um, second. Uh, you, yeah. Twenty-three and me? Oh yeah, you absolutely. You got to go look for your uh, Neanderthal number. It's great. No, he said ancestry. Oh, oh ancestry. Ancestry is what I use. I'm you not might here be able to, to promote their over. specific service, but um, so Mark, what what you were saying though is certainly um, is certainly worth talking about because. I mean, look, honestly, part of the problem here is that when we talk about something like education, we're talking about a system that is funded basically by your zip code and the property taxes yeah. in your zip code. So if you're from a poor community, your school is going to get less funding, and it perpetuates all those economic inequalities. Sure. I think the way we fund education in this country is kind of a disaster for that reason. Well, and, and my question is, is that as we support government funded education, we have 100 years of seeing how this is done, at least here in the United States. And I'm not saying that they can't do it better, um, that you can't take a sort of socialized model and make it run more efficiently. However, what I haven't seen ever is some kind of comparison between uh, American private education and say the Finnish model or something like that. I'd be fascinated to be able to look at that. You know, how do the do, do, do the Finnish does the Finnish model really take every student, shove them all together in a one size fits all system, and somehow spit out these perfect students? Because I don't think it does. I mean, well, is it I, better I think than part U.S.? Of what we're talking about right now is evaluating the, um, the the criteria on which we we judge education or any other you know any other commodity or any other service. Which is to say, are we going to look at the individual results of the very best candidate? Then yeah, of course, a Harvard education or some other elite private institution is going to give you the very best education. Yeah. But is that model scalable for an entire country? Probably not. So then you have to ask yourself, well, what model is going to be available for most people so that the average working class person is now in a better standard of living than they were 100 years ago? Well, and the fact that people class. can go to public school, that's a part of it. Which well, class is working class? Which class is working class? Yes. I mean, we can talk about what you do for a living if you have a blue collar. No, no, no I'm talking talk about which about quintile. Oh, um, I, I'm using these terms with, with like the least economic expertise, but I'm going to talk about people who are sort of uh, lower to lower middle class. Okay. Um, so lower, so the, the bottom two quintiles. Okay. So that, fine. Sure. I just, I, I would contend that the bottom quintile isn't working class, that that's a, a class of people that generally doesn't work much at all. But, um, 
Oh, Mark, that's not true. There are plenty of people who work 40 hours, 50, 60 hours a week and are living in functionally poverty level wages because of the way that we pay people in this country. So uh, th th we'll move on to, uh, you know, these these numbers. I, I made, uh, you know, minimum wage at one point in life. I was 15. Yeah, I did, too. I was <laughs> I was about 16 minimum wage. Doesn't yep. it didn't you find it staggering and odd that uh, people who that, you know, you know what it was like to make minimum wage, that somehow people can't rise above that, whatever that is? Uh, we could talk about why that is. Uh, when I was working minimum wage, there were plenty of people who uh, were in their 30s, 40s, and 50s working at the same fast food restaurant that I did. Um, and I can tell you that in, in the post-recession era of the United States, most of the jobs that have been created are you know, temporary, part-time, independent contractor, uh, service sector jobs that pay um, not minimum wage, but within like three to five dollars of minimum wage and are functionally minimum wage. I've got a truck driver friend who sends me pictures from all over the country where he finds, uh, you know, people who are doing warehouse work for whatever reason. There's a lot of signs for warehouse work and they're 17, 18, 19, 20 dollars an hour all across the country. I mean, I'm not talking about New York City or anything like that. I don't look. I, I can only say what it, what I experience in my life. But, um, you know, and I don't know what these statistics are, but I know that people can lie with statistics. There's there's right now companies that are offering twenty dollars an hour jobs in Missouri uh, because I just got this this picture from off. You know, this guy sent it to me from two days ago where, you know, I mean, that's that's there's the heartland. There's a pay that people can that's well above this uh, fight for 15 thing. I, I don't know. I. Well, if I could yeah. interject well, here okay, on the, yeah. the question of, because you had talked about, you know, what's the best system? Is this the best system? Obviously not. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the, do the Finns have the best system? I mean, what is the best system? Mm -hmm. To me, mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't matter what the best system is if it's being forced down people's throats. All right, by let's the, do the taxation by the, step. By the threat, yeah. of, by you, the threat you, of violence. You're dealing with Ian on this one. Uh, because, yeah, yeah. you know, I want to see people get a good education, and I am, it, you're going to have a tough time, or anybody's going to have a tough time convincing me that the best education in the world could come from a centrally managed, politically oriented, violent organization, whether it's run by Barack Obama or whether it's run by George Bush or Donald Trump, it's going to be bad. It's going to be political. They're going to shove their views, which are views that uh, that promote obedience, right? Like the government school system and even many private school systems are very top down, very centrally managed and very much all about this, you know, the Prussian supposed model of education where the kids are taught you speak when you're, you know, when you raise your hand, you be quiet when the lights get turned off, you move from one location to another when the bells ring, and you do what you're told and you respect authority. There was a really interesting, uh, and I realize this is extended here, uh, but there was an interesting conversation I had at the 420 this year out, out in Concord that uh, several of us had with a, a school teacher <clears throat> who was there. A uh, really cool lady. She was talking about how she wanted to take her high school class. She teaches at the government school uh, there in Manchester, one of the government schools in, in Manchester. She wanted to take her high school class out. It was a nice day. Uh, she's a biology teacher, but she, for whatever reason, wanted to take them out to do some yoga in an area of the school that was generally unused. It was like an outside uh, area. So she gets in her head. She wants to do this. Uh, she tries to just take the class out, but unfortunately, the door is locked because, you know, it's a prison. And so yeah, middle class yeah. welfare babysitting day prison. Right. This isn't a bad school. Right. But this Danny is... doesn't disagree with any of this. OK, but I don't know what Danny disagrees with. I'm not presuming anything. So what, I'm just going to finish the story. Okay. So she tries to take them out. The door is locked. She has to call somebody administration to explain what she wants to do. Get the door unlocked. She talked to the to to the principal about it. He authorizes it. The door gets unlocked. She goes out there and they start doing yoga. Well, as they're doing this, a vice principal of the school walks by. Of course, he has no idea what they're there for, right? One hand's not talking to the other. He just knows they're in an area they're not generally supposed to be. And so, you know, he stops them and, you know, assert, asserts his authority as the co-warden of the of the prison that they're in and, uh, you know, is, expresses surprise that they would be out there. And she explains, oh, I've got permission from the warden. You know, the principal told me that, you know, we can be out here doing this. And he ra radios in and we radio back and... Okay, fine. So he moves along, and then somebody else comes along, some administrator of some fashion, I forget, a guidance counselor or whatever, and something similar happens there. So she's been, you know, stopped by two other bureaucrats already, just trying to have the
have the class outside for the day. And so then two cops come by. And one of them is the school resource officer. The other one is the uh, like former school resource officer. So the more, more the most previous one was there for that day, working with the, the current one. And they're walking through, and they're then things really get interesting because then it's uh, well, you're not supposed to be out here. Your class isn't supposed to be in this area. And she tries to explain that she has permission, and they just couldn't believe uh, that that would be the case. And they order her to go back inside, and she refuses uh, to do what they said. And this just sets the uh, police officer off because teachers are supposed to model a good example for their students. When a authority figure like this person with the badge tells a teacher to do something, she should do what they're t what they're telling her to do because it looks bad. They actually lectured her after her kids went back in the room. They lectured her about how surprised they were that you would do this. Now, she's a new teacher there. She's it's, she's on her first year. And uh, so like, oh, my goodness, this teacher stepping out of line. She's a bad example. She was talked about this later by the principal, who was also even though he'd given her permission to be there, the principal expressed that he was upset that she would balk at what the police were telling her, that she would question what the police were telling her example because, set for the children. because of the example it sets for the children. This is sort of my, my larger point here is that the government schools teach obedience. And I don't think that there's any government that's ever going to be formed, no matter which political party is in charge of it. Uh, regardless of the funding method, they want to teach people to not question authority. And I think that's fundamentally a problem. Um, I'm, I'm going to kind of take this in reverse order. Um, Ian, I'm going to agree with you to some extent here because I think the United States is verging on a police state, if it isn't already one. Oh, it's already I there. Think there are yeah, there are a lot of ways that we can divide that up just by the number of incarcerated people we have in this country. It's one of the oh, things we're number sure. one in the world in, right? Yep. Um, there are incidents in the United States where police fire more bullets in that one incident than entire countries' uh, police forces <laughs> fire in a year yeah, yeah. in other countries, right? So these things, these things are true. We know they're true. Um, I will say that uh, democracy is probably the worst system that we have in the world, except for all the other ones. Um, and if, if there there's a other... strong argument that a uh, benevolent <laughs> dictator would be a better system if they, you know, would just leave people alone. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think it was in Mad Magazine that the problem with uh, with socialism is that one man takes from another, and the problem with capitalism is it's the other way around. Yeah. <laughs> um, so let me go back, Mark, because you talked about this twenty dollars an hour uh, job in the heartland, right? Yeah. Um, I, I would simply ask, without knowing more about the specific job, and maybe you don't either, um, does that twenty an hour job include things like health care? Um, because we in this country, for a, so a number of reasons, healthcare is ruined, and yeah. uh, healthcare is ruined, and it was ruined by government intervention. And I don't think we can ever go back. I mean, I'm going to call it the impossible solution that the the that uh, medicine be provided in the marketplace, and that um, you know the same thing that has driven down the costs of elective plastic surgery, um, mm -hmm. elective uh, LASIK surgery, and elective medical. I mean, the prices and the prices have gone down, and the quality's gone up of elective yeah. surgery in the United States. Yeah. Th those market forces well, and, don't and Mark, exist. As soon as, it, as soon as I can plan for my coronary bypass in the same way that I can plan for my breast augmentation, I think you might have a good argument there. Um, well, I'm they glad, don't do I want to be able to talk well, about education and My mom had tonight. her stint surgery done weeks in advance. She could have okay. chosen to go someplace else. Um, and they do have some places. I think it's a uh, uh, medical uh, center of Oklahoma City or something where you could choose or you can go overseas and do things significantly less costly. I'm not saying it's there's certainly medical uh, emergency medical procedures out there and the government ruined medicine in this country. Maybe the only solution at this point is a socialized medical system because it's the only one that's politically expedient. But don't expect no, it's me not. <laughs> not for people that are not politically expedient to assist, not for uh, elderly folks or tiny babies like we've seen in the UK where they're just sentencing kids to death even though the parents want them to survive. It's some crazy shit they're doing. Well, that's the truth, right? There will be death panels, and at that point it will be the government uh, that has you to You can't. Make those that's, decisions. A, that's my point about schools is anytime the government's in charge, whether the, we're talking about hospitals or we're talking about the government schools, it's a politicized institution every single time. And you talk to teachers and they'll tell you about it. 
uh, the you know the, how there's a political belief that is being crammed down the students' throats, let alone the fact that everybody's uh, forced to pay for it. I don't want Trump educating uh, my kids, and I don't want Barack Obama doing it either. Uh, so, Mark, I, I think, and Ian, um, it's, it's worth asking ourselves if if, uh, if this free market system of healthcare is so great, why we don't see it um, in any other country to scale? Why, if you look at the, the countries with the best healthcare outcomes on an average basis, if you look at, for example, the longest life expectancies in the world, you don't see it coming out of systems that are, you know, privatized in nature. You see it from countries that invest in public healthcare and whose citizens can go in for a routine checkup without worrying about the copay or the deductible, um, well, they can catch uh, one symptom or problem early rather than waiting until it's a much more serious problem, which is what happens in this country. I mean, in the last few years, the United States has actually increased um, its, uh, its uh, one female mortality rate during uh, pregnancy uh, in maternity wards where women give birth. The United States is actually is faltering in that way, while other countries tend to have that number going down. And for the last several years, in the United States, uh, average life expectancy has fallen because more middle-aged white men and others um, are kind of dying early deaths of despair with alcohol and drug abuse and things of that nature. Um, I, I would say just for a second, Mark, that, that this $20 an hour job, et cetera, that we're talking about, um, those jobs are starting to go away. And if we're willing to confront an issue like automation and AI and how it's going to just totally wreck the way people like truck drivers are going to make their living in five or 10 years, Years, we need to get really serious about how technology is going to fundamentally change uh, the way a lot of us go to work. It's worth pointing well, out that the uh, medical system here is in no way free market. It is highly regulated. Right. Well, and you highly get, we, controlled. He's got us on the yeah, ropes in the same way we had him on the ropes on the educational system. And he's he's right to do that because we kept hitting him on the uh, the public education system. No, I don't think anyone is defending. on the ropes here. You guys haven't shown me a single other country that has a privatized sure. system at a national level that produces students who are accelerating beyond that of the students I who are in a model a like level. Finland or others. I, I, I can't on a national level because the problem is is that there are certain sort of, we'll call them memes or uh, zeitgeist in the world, and socialism was a strong zeitgeist starting in the late 1800s on through today. The well, notion that the government should provide me with medical care and education and God knows what else at some point or another they're going to you know make sure that my dog's fed or you know whatever it is um, you, you were just bringing up the truck drivers pretty soon that the idea that has will go from each according to his ability to each according to his need to everybody should get a paycheck no matter what and you know, maybe that's maybe that's the way it needs to be I don't want to show anybody a, a privatized system because I don't want a privatized system I don't want a system it typically when you hear that that term, it means that somebody in government awards an elite contract to somebody, some corporate uh, fat cat uh, in industry, like you've seen with privatized prisons or whatever. For instance, in this this country, I don't want anything to be privatized. I just want to you know people to not be coerced, and then whatever comes out of that, uh, I'm fine with. And I, I suspect it would be better than what we have. But even if you could say it wasn't, and this is a question I think Mark, you've asked me in the past, like if the statistics showed that a government-run system was somehow better than one that was run uh, you know, in the marketplace, in the free market, uh, would I change my mind about that? And my answer, of course, is no, because I'm not okay with threatening my neighbor in order to get them to do what I think is best. How do you feel about that? Uh, so this is one of the areas of libertarianism that I think are uh, stronger arguments, uh, and these are philosophical arguments. If we're talking about the non-aggression principle, if we're talking about people who uh, just simply like, well, what if I don't want to pay for your education? Are you going to send men with guns to my house You know, if I refuse to pay my taxes? I understand those arguments. All right, Those are actually the things that I find appealing about libertarianism. Right. Um, and I would say, like, look, if you're, and I'm not trying to demean you guys by bringing up this example, okay, but if you were a, uh, a college freshman in a philosophy class and you encounter the ideas of Ayn Rand, objectivism, or things like this, that's really appealing. And so you see a real kind of outgrowth of uh, libertarian representation demographically among younger white men, because yes. this seems to be a, a sort of a, a set of ideas that are appealing to a certain group of people at a certain time in their life. 
okay? But if you have been a statistically marginalized group of people and you've never had access to those sets of resources in your collective, you know, ancestral memory, then the notion that, that well, we'll just let everyone do what they want, we'll let the market decide, and if you can't eat at Woolworths because the, the private property owner decides they don't like people with your skin color, we'll just hope the marketplace will sufficiently punish them. Um, and for By a the long way, Woolworths is South, huge in Mexico. <laughs> I just want to say Woolworths yeah. still exists. It's huge in Mexico. Yeah. And they still have lunch counters. <laughs> yeah. So what I would say in that circumstance is, is that um, there's no doubt that this discrimination existed in the United States. And I don't like it one way or the other um, when it, you know, when it comes down. I don't want to see discrimination on any level. But I do think that people should be able to determine who they're going to do business with, because otherwise all you're doing is driving down, driving underground the discrimination. Um, I know. think I know your answer to this, Mark, but if your job is working in the county clerk's office and a gay couple comes in wanting a marriage certificate um, and you say, well, I'm not going to issue one because of my religious beliefs, like uh, like bad. this woman who, who did that, right? Well, yep. well she, you know, she's in a government job. She's yep. supposed to f perform a state function. She refuses to citing these beliefs. I and mean, this is serious. You could be a pharmacist and refuse to, you know, prescribe birth control or, um, um, you know, a morning after pill. You could be a doctor who refuses to, you know, operate on a, on a baby of a, a same-sex couple or something. These are real problems. If she refunds my last five years worth of uh, tax payments to her rapacious and violent organization, then absolutely turn me away. And no. Okay, Mark, but we know it's not going to work that way. No, no, it's not. Because, <laughs> and this is the point that I'd like to make to you, Danny, is, is, yeah. that, is that government, um, you'll, they, will, they, people in power, uh, uh, people who are rich have always been able to buy or be the people in power, right? Agreed. 9,000 years. And never in the course of human history, you were saying, well, where is this place where medicine works, blah, blah, blah. Well, tell me the place, and you can use time, whatever, where uh, the poor and the powerless have ever ruled anything, themselves, anything. They never get a chance to because the rich and powerful will always have the reins of power. So when you're Here's talking about this, hold on, hold on. I want to answer your hypothetical. I will. You've asked me a question. Hold on, hold on. I want wait, to, wait, I to finish the, I got a last little point here. So when okay. we talk about ethnically disadvantaged people who want to see justice done through the state those people are living a fucking dream they think that like the only thing they can ever hope for is to outbreed uh the ethnically advantaged people and then take over and do the same goddamn shit to them that's well, Mark, the only I don't hope know they if have. you slept through the 2018 midterms, but we saw more women of color uh, elected to uh, office in Congress than we've ever seen yes. in history. And these people are taking positions that we just, you know, fundamentally haven't heard. We now have two Muslim women of color in Congress. I find it ironic that that we were all the people who were lecturing us about political correctness and complaining about it are the people who are the most upset when the two first Muslim women of color say anything, um, anything. in Congress these days. Right. right. Those, those um, ladies can't say go, anything. Let me go back to the question you asked, because the answer to your question is the 20th century in the United States, thanks to things like the New Deal, thanks to things like progressive taxation, has seen the emergence of a middle class that just did not exist before. Now, I will not say that is only government policies, of course, because Good. there were many innovations in the marketplace, well, in the regulated marketplace that were actually also a part of that system. I'll but add something to that. The only way that we can have any collective power is through some democratic system whereby the people can represent one another and their interests and they can unionize and they can collectively bargain and they can join together um, so that the financial elites don't own everything and we don't live in some kind of serfdom where might makes right and the ruling class decides everything for everyone. I think uh, collective bargaining on the in the private sector is, I mean, it appears to be dead. If it's not, it's uh, it, it, it's on life support. Um, yeah, because we have all these right to work for less states. 
Well, I mean, if, if are you going to tell somebody that they have to pay union dues in order to, to work in a particular sector? I mean, that's... Well, I will say that if they're working in a union uh, sector labor market and they're enjoying all of the benefits that union due-paying members have earned, then they're kind of free riders. They're kind of free riders if they're, if they're enjoying all the benefits, but they're not chipping in to make those benefits possible. That well, seems like a problem. Um, is, is all you have to do is read the news stories about how the uh, union thugs will go in and uh, you know harm people that choose to work for less uh, in certain circumstances. You're, yeah, you're, and I'm you're not on going the to violence. defend that, that behavior. Yeah, it just sounds like another it. government to I me. I wouldn't defend it when the, uh, when the private, uh, when the private, um, uh, when the private owners of a, a coal company or a coal town yep. or something hire all of the uh, all the private security to beat down the uh, the union workers either, so we Agreed. can agree that violence is wrong. Okay, right. I, but I'm just saying that it, it, for unions to work, it appears to need to, to have a certain amount of force that's necessary to get people on board and give up an amount of their check. Well, you're just saying that's the way it appears, but there's nothing wrong with the idea of no, people collectively wrong bargaining with your clubs. to um, uh, to benefit. But once you bring in the the threat of force against those who don't want to go along with you know whatever the bargaining agreement is then that's then there's a problem now you're just talking about creating another government uh, okay so i want to bring up this point danny and this is something that never gets looked at when people say the middle class submerged in the united states um when Rep when republicans say they want to go back to a simpler time they almost always will be referring to the 1950s when yeah. uh, you know black people had to ride the back of the bus and a whole or bunch the of other 1850s. things some of them like the 1850s more. I like the 1870s, if I may. Yeah. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's mm -hmm. certainly not about, uh, you know, the subjugation of ethnic groups. It's more about... You would not like the dental care of the 1870s. <laughs> I will give you that. But I certainly do like the idea that uh, in a 12-year period, uh, personal income doubled for the average working American. And you just don't see anything like that in any other time frame. But this is an important factor. In the 1950s, when both Democrats and Republicans always want to go back to this magic decade, and I think it's because of the happy day, 1970s and 80s happy days TV show. It's but, magic for white people, Mark. It is. Um, and But this 1950s time frame was right after every industrialized nation had been bombed to hell. And there was no one to compete so yeah, of course, skilled labor. Yeah, that helped. That helped. It, it's a big factor. And that helped, but you know what else helped? The GI Bill helped. Getting yeah. a generation of people who hadn't gone to college before to go to college, and then investing heavily in science, technology, and medicine. Those things also really helped. Science, technology, and medicine are great places, and I recommend people who want who want to pursue careers in that do so. Um, it's uh, it's the vast majority of college degrees, especially the ones in you know. I always go after communications because I'm in uh, radio, and neither one of us has a communications degree, and mm -hmm. we're some of the the last people that are probably going to make a, a paycheck in this uh, this this uh, realm. I just like to encourage any young people listening uh, who want to better their lives: do not join the military, uh, do not die for politicians, even though it might mean you might get uh, sent to college. Even though I've heard they've screwed people over on that deal in a lot of cases. Yeah, well, and, and that's part of the problem, isn't it? We have a generation of people who can only afford to uh, ascend any kind of uh, prospect for a better life by going to college because there is some government uh, military program that allows them to do that. If we just invested in public college on the front end, like we did a generation ago, you could work a summer job to get into college, and you wouldn't have to go halfway around the world to die for people that, that don't want you in their country in order to get a college degree here. Don't you think that the college bubble was created by easy government uh, loan money? Uh, that colleges are seeing that people can sign their name on a dotted line instead of uh, you know writing a check. Uh, I've thought and read a lot about this issue, Mark, and yes. I think that that is certainly one component. I think, that, frankly, the private lending um, institutions that got involved in higher education and created a system of lending standards um, that, that would be the envy of every mafia in the world, that even in bankruptcy, you can't oh, yeah. discharge your student loans. I mean, that's, that's insane, and we shouldn't have had that. And we shouldn't have the rates that we have 
uh, on interest for student loan repayments if this is supposed to be an investment in the next generation instead right. of making them indebted. Right. I'm so ignorant on there. college loans and all that. I, I went to two, you know two years of uh, associates in uh, community college. And you so paid for it with it. your uh, Kmart p- paycheck. Well, no, I didn't actually. Oh, it was yeah. the government paid for oh, it that's through right. you uh, had Bright the, Futures. The I think Florida was, Academic Scholarship, what they call, which did yeah. come come out of my paycheck ultimately, and it came out of a lot of people's paychecks sure. but uh doesn't the government hand out college loans i thought it was like fanny may or freddie the mac or one of those guaranteed. things yeah those those are those are servicers of those loans and you know we can talk a lot about uh, and this is the whole debate we're having now about what is socialism right so if you right, if I you don't have even know. public pri- if you have public private partnerships where the government ensures that everyone has health care but they're still paying you know companies and individual doctors in a in a free market system is that really socialism is it democratic socialism is it, it ain't a, a free market democracy? whatever it is if it's a system yeah, well, with the government involved it's not free we've never had a free market i mean yeah. that doesn't exist as a concept. We'd like to think of something as a free market, but the only kind of marketplace we've ever had is some degree or another of regulation. Yeah, you can compare markets, you can compare, you know, how industries are in markets that are more or less regulated. And of course, you can look at, Mark, you gave a few examples within healthcare Mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, the elective surgeries like LASIK, which don't have near as many uh, regulations upon them. And so you see the prices going down, you see more robust competition, you see quality going up. You can look at the computer business, for instance, also very lowly regulated. Thankfully, the government doesn't approve software. Uh, we don't have a software approval board. Can you imagine how terrible it would have been if you'd had to have uh, you know, sent your video game into some government censor uh, before you know what it was allowed to be sold on the market? Yeah, that's I mean, New Zealand. That do that, and that's yeah. a pretty terrible, uh, that's a t- pretty terrible way to order Organize your media. I mean, I I really believe in the Bill of Rights, and I think that we should assert uh, we should assert those rights uh, quite prominently. I also know, uh, Ian, that you have some skepticism about the Constitution because it uh, it either authorized all of the uh, tyranny that we experience, or it was unable to prevent it. That's so I, uh, I correct. I think the Sanders Spooner said that, and uh, he said correct. it very well. Yeah. So, Mark, uh, just going back to, to the question oh, about hold education Hold on. I, I just here. want to give a real quick uh, fact check here. I, I did yeah. find that email. Um, this is from Menomi, Wisconsin. I said it was from Missouri. and I Is that say how that, you pronounce that? I, I have no idea how you pronounce it. I'm just saying what I see here. And it is a Walmart uh, warehouse job. Go ahead, Danny, with what you're saying. Yeah, um, simply that there are a lot of issues with the reason why education costs so much. Part of it is that we've decided that education is now the place where we entertain a generation of people with sports stadiums and all these really luxurious um, uh, dormitories and student life centers. Um, It's just a much more comprehensive model of what education is supposed to be. And the number of administrators on the campus has increased like three or four fold from a generation ago. You're still having the same number of faculty. Many of them are now adjunct faculty. They're not really making much yes. money in higher oh, education. Well, that's a, this is one of the reasons I tell young, uh, you know, if, if a young person ever calls in or I'll just sort of make this up as I go, you know, what used to be a real career college professor is at this point a joke. I mean, you cannot, it's a part-time job and it's, you know, it, it's not great, but it only indicates how, you know, less and less useful the uh, degree is because now you're being taught by people who are less qualified. In some cases, actually, they're more qualified because they work in the marketplace and then they come in and they do, you know, evening classes and, and that kind of thing. But I wouldn't say that that's necessarily the, uh, the the norm. So, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of problems with the way what these education people are, are getting. But uh, when I, you, you work for a community college, am I correct um, in saying that? Yeah, I, you okay. know, I, I kind of run the gamut. I've, I've taught at uh, private nonprofit institutions. I've taught... Um, I've taught a little bit at for-profit institutions, and I've taught it at uh, state institutions, so public as, institutions. Uh, so speaking of a community college here, um, so when I, I the only schooling I've ever really been to is uh, community college and correspondence uh, classes, and they were all pretty reasonably priced. I wouldn't have called them cheap, but you know at the time, but it wasn't anything I was going to go into debt over. And, uh, you know, the books could have been less costly, but these were core requirements and not that uh, big of a deal. Um, I mean, are community colleges that much cheaper now or are they driven up in price because their competition is so ridiculously high they can get away with charging more? And if they are higher, why is it? Is it because of uh, administration or what? 
Um, I think community colleges are still the most affordable way to get education after high school. But I just want to step back here. Like, why is it that uh, K through 12 education, uh, public schools um, can be received by anyone in this country um, with without, you know, paying for it on the front end and yeah. is paid through taxation? That's a lot because the, the level of education we needed at that time used to be fifth grade, and then it used to be a high school degree. But you and I both know that we can't find really competitive, meaningful work with a high school degree without, you know, a significant amount of struggle. Um, and those are the most economically vulnerable people when there is a recession. We know that as well. So oh, that's you me, know, buddy. <laughs> I, 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 and, and you got you guys are certainly outliers in some respects. Well, Ian's, I, I got, a, my Ian's, Ian's got a very enviable associate's degree. Okay, very good, very good. So I'm, I'm only here to say that, that if we're going to, you know, for the people that balk at the idea of uh, tuition-free college or debt-free college, whatever you want to call it, free college, it's not free, of course, we know that. Yeah. Um, but if we're going to say that that, uh, that K through 12 should be something that, that young people can attain without um, paying on the front end, then we should be willing to entertain the idea that at least a two-year college um, extension of that in a community college setting or a four-year degree or something of that nature, um, because the kind of economy that we're competing in now um, requires additional education. And look, I would say that that should be a good thing, right? We're moving into a society where we use technology to fulfill more and more of our daily tasks. And if it weren't for the fact that our livelihood is connected to earning a paycheck by performing work, the fact that all these jobs are being automated away should be thrilling to us because most of us don't actually want to do those jobs, but we have found no other way by which people can have a dignified life uh, without them. And so that's something I think needs to change. I'm not here to plug politicians, but I would tell people to look into someone like Andrew Yang, who's talked a lot about universal basic income and a freedom dividend or some way that we can automate the fact that someone like Jeff Bezos is worth $150 billion. Amazon paid no taxes last year, actually got $130 million rebate in taxes. That's the American people but that wrote Jeff Amazon Bezos, a check. Oh, okay, so <laughs> this is this is standard issue leftist uh, talking points. And it's the That's kind right. That, I actually get a George Soros check every week, and it's, no, it's no, fantastic. No, no, I don't believe you get it any more than I get a Coke check. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> but, I mean, there's sta but it's standard issue, you'd agree. Jeff Bezos... Is, has basically delivered, um, you know, uh, the services that America has wanted, and of course he should be well rewarded. And no, um, I don't think he should have had to pay one penny. I'll defend okay. well, Bezos in this because, yeah, I mean, you know, the roads existed, but he, yeah. you know, the taxes were paid on those things already. This is the, well, they were the paid, least Mark, efficient. But of course, all of these companies rely on maintained public infrastructure. Sure. They rely on a workforce that is healthy, that is literate. They rely on a court system and a police The government had plenty of money property. to spend on um, infrastructure if they wanted to, but instead they found the opportunity to go and bomb brown people. Now yeah, we're and I'm not going to defend that either. You're trillion exactly dollars correct. in debt, and the, the problem is, is nobody wants to take responsibility for it. Danny, what's it going to be like when our economy, when the United States uh, government is $40 trillion in debt? What's that going to look like? Um, I would tell you it depends on what you think about uh, economic theory. Uh, it depends on what you think about where the money comes from if it was just printed uh, from ones and zeros to begin with and had no hard backing. Um, you know, here's the problem, Mark. We have not run this experiment before. We are now a global civilization of yep. over 7 billion people. We're fundamentally altering the planet. Um, the projection for millions of species to go extinct is now on order. Um, and life 100 years from now will look very different um, and in usually not very good ways unless we're willing to make a lot of pretty significant changes. Um, and there are still people right now that are worried about transgender people using the bathroom or whether yeah. we're going to bomb Iran or, you know. Those are the kind of things that you get can get people whipped up about. Um, you, what you can't get them whipped up about for whatever reason is the, the sort of the global warming crisis. And I think to some extent that has to do with overselling it by the eco crowd out there, you know, making predictions, those predictions falling wildly short. Um, and, you know, when the time frame comes due, because, you know, we, we have predictions. And yeah, well, we thought that for a while, Mark, but yeah. then we had a town called Paradise that turned into a living hell. We have entire parts of the country that are flooded beyond measure. We have cities that are wiped out by floods and hurricanes. Um, we have areas that have such droughts that it's all 
altering um, patterns of immigration where people are fleeing their country because they simply can't grow food there anymore. Well, that might um, have something to do with the United States foreign policy to some extent. Too. It could have something to do with that. Yeah, yeah. these are not un uh, look, unconnected I, I'm not the, problems. You won't find me arguing about global warming. Ian has stepped okay. away to use the bathroom, so you might find him arguing it. But um, okay. I, I don't you, – you're not – like, I'm not that guy. However, um, I would say that, you know, my, my defense would be is why are we going to take – the least efficient, least effective organizational model that the world has ever known and that apply it to this important, uh, you know, task. Maybe well, science think, will solve let's, us let's, with uh, solve the problem with uh, carbon dioxide scrubbers. But yeah. the government currently is funding things like, uh, you know, uh, methane production through uh, cows and, uh, you know, livestock uh, subsidies. They also uh, have subsidies on corn, which is uh, nitrous oxide. So this yeah. organization that proposes to solve the problem through carbon dioxide, which may very well be the least of our concern when it comes to greenhouse gases, is the organization you want to put in, um, you know, they propose to solve it. You want them in, to, in charge of solving it. They're never yeah. going to do what you want, Danny. You know, They're the, the biggest government. Uh, polluter, the biggest single polluter is the United States military. And we should not be surprised by that, given that they have something like 800 military bases in mm -hmm. 70 countries. Oh, and those, so, those I mean, uh, aircraft carriers aren't exactly uh, carbon neutral either. No, they're not. No, they're not. Uh, and, you know, we, we can talk about why we're even uh, willing to go to war over something that we should have kept in the ground to begin with uh, once we knew what was good for us. Um, so you're not going to get any arguments from me on that particular issue. But if you're going to look at something like global warming um, or global climate change, global climate disruption, um, we need to be honest about the fact that this is an all hands on deck proposition. We need people in the private sector who are in innovating, you know, um, different types of solar arrays or larger capacity batteries yep. um, for electrification of the, uh, of, the, of the grid and transportation. Um, and we need to be able to allocate public resources to be able to fund some of these innovations and make sure that, that every house in America has a solar panel on top of it that generates the electricity that's used inside of it or something of that nature. I'm not an expert on this issue, but I know that we need a lot, uh, or we need many different solutions working together. So you're not going to hear me say that, that all of this should be run out of the out of the Bureau of, uh, of of Green Energy or something, and everything has to be stamped by that. Uh, It'll that be run out of the source. Pentagon and uh, out of, uh, you know, uh, corporate paid uh, lobbyists. Well, one of the things like I wanted to jump in been. here, uh, I was out kind of doing a couple things there, and uh, I heard the comment about, <laughs> I, heard, I was listening on uh, dlive.lrn.fm to what you guys were talking about. I want to jump back to Bezos real fast. Um, yeah. Taxing Bezos, taxing Amazon, taxing these corporations, of course, just means that they pay, you know, pass those taxes on to the buyers. And so the buyers have to bear all of their taxes. Whereas, of course, the people on the sort of the bottom end of the pyramid that you were referring to earlier, Mark, uh, poor people, they get fucked when uh, well, taxes when taxes hit them because there's nobody they can pass those on to. Right. So taxes you know, always hit the poor time, people the hardest. Once upon a time, before there was Amazon, there was uh, your local hardware store. There still and, is. Uh, They're still and, here in, yeah. in Keene. Okay, that's that's great for Keene. Um, a, lo a lot of uh, a lot of storefronts have been hit really hard by places like Amazon. And sure. uh, while Amazon pays very little or nothing in federal taxes, all of those small businesses used to pay taxes. So we're seeing the kind of debt that we talk about because we're not collecting the revenue that we used to, and we're so enamored with tax. Hold on, wait, wait, wait. When you say we, down. you mean the government, right? Because I'm not part of them. But uh, and I heard, <laughs> well, I, I, mean, I heard I mean they the are collecting States, more revenue. The collective experiment that we're trying to run, whether you want to be a part of. It or not. I definitely don't. But I did hear okay. that they are collecting more revenue uh, under Trump. I don't know if it's true, but that's just what I've heard. So, like, there's the, you know, it's a it's uh, the annual plain. deficit is increasing under the Trump administration. That is in small part because of spending. That is in large part because of falling revenue collection. Huh. Well, what if uh, the I would uh, my concern with Trump is, is that so, uh, you know, Bush comes in, the debt's t uh, five trillion uh, Obama comes in, the debt is ten trillion. Trump comes in, the debt is twenty trillion. If Trump gets eight years, and I don't think there's any guarantee of that, but you, know, you presume it is, then at the end of that eight years, then the debt should be. If you're just looking at the, you know, the the tracking this on a chart, it should be forty trillion. 
And mm-hmm. this is a deep concern of mine uh, as far as this country goes. I don't think that it can maintain its status as uh, you know the world's leader, the world's reserve currency, and and these sorts of things with that kind of debt. That um, you know ultimately that's a terrible. Uh, pattern to see perpetuated. Well, let's talk about that, Mark. Where, who, do, who is that debt owed to? Who is, who is the collector of that debt? Um, in this case, it's uh, large banking organizations, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Some of them are international. Some of them are domestic. Right. I, I hate using this terminology, international bankers. But, <laughs> yeah, international bankers, sure. Yeah, so, I mean, ultimately, we need to get serious about what we want our government to do, okay? Because we're either – we're not going to not have a government. We can well, probably agree that there are things we don't want the government to be doing more of, like going to war, like locking up nonviolent people. Um, but there are probably some things we might be able to agree that the government is not doing right now that maybe it should be doing, Um and so we need to we need to kind of decide what we want me. our government to do. Okay. <laughs> well, so Danny, if, if we, they're not leaving me alone, they're doing too much. We know what happens okay. when Democrats get in office. We have. I know we, what happens when Republicans get in office. Oh, the government gets bigger. We have Utah. We have Texas to see what happens when Republicans get yeah. in office. We have New York State, New Jersey, Illinois. You pick your state. There are blue states out there. States that have not elected a Republican to major office in you know uh, they haven't had a majority of Republicans or whatever, you you can find these numbers. They're out there. We know what it looks like when Democrats or Republicans are in office. They've already ugly. done it. So, yeah. you know, it bounces back and forth in Washington, well, Mark, D.C. how many states are run by libertarians? Zero. And I get that you're probably not even thinking of capital L libertarians here. Um, but to kind of go back to my earlier point, this is, this is a major problem. So because, hold on, Danny, uh, we, I'd like to, I'd like to argue the, the, fallacy, <laughs> the, the logical fallacy of arg- argument from ignorance. We, don't, we have never seen a libertarian government, so therefore libertarian governments are, are impossible. <laughs> We well, we've seen, seen when they're tried, Mark. We've seen when they're tried, and they never get to the point where we can talk about them at any length because places like Western Sahara or Somalia don't scale up into wonderful organizations. <laughs> well, Somalia's occupied territory. If they could just market chlamydia. Um, so <laughs> um, what I would say I to them— I think you mean cholera, Mark. I think oh, you mean damn cholera. It. Cholera. <laughs> damn it. I, I remember the joke. And He's I, just a sales guy. He doesn't uh, know what it's Okay, about. okay. Damn it. Um— yeah, I had uh, you know some kind of uh, rebuttal. Oh, the argument <laughs> from ignorance. is curable, which is pretty nice. Yeah, the, the argument from ignorance. Uh, at one point, we hadn't seen what it was like to not have uh, enslaved, enslaved black people picking cotton either, but somehow we made it. Mm, uh, we have a caller. Uh, oh my God! So uh, I co- forgot that we even oh, wow. offered that. Yeah, we should. I didn't we should, know this was a call-in show. We should have mentioned okay. that. I mean, you, if, Danny, okay. I apologize for anything that's said it's to you. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is Turd Ferguson who who does, by the way, hold the title of being the one person to run Chris the fucking crying Nazi Cantwell right out of this studio when we had an wow. after show uh, with Chris Cantwell. So Turd Ferguson holds that title. Chris Cantwell fucking booked it out of here as soon as this guy came on the line. So let's see how this goes. Uh, Turd. Ferguson, you're on with Danny Ladani on Free Talk. Yeah, hi guys. Um, and, and I, yeah, I. By the way, Danny, you. can you hear him fine? Yes, I can. Okay, great. Go ahead. Great, great, great. Yeah, I appreciate you guys taking my call tonight as, as well. Um, and I don't. I already do not hate this guy nearly as much as I hate Chris Cantwell. <laughs> it's easy. Um, Danny's a nice guy. <laughs> yeah, he's he's, t- he's totally a nice guy. It, it's it's interesting. He said he voted for Harry Brown in two thousand, but he sounds like pretty young. Like he's he's got a youthful voice. I, I don't know. It's 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 weird. Yeah, two thousand was my first election. I was the ripe age of eighteen in time to vote. Oh, oh, right, ripe age of eighteen, huh? Yep. Yeah. Great. Good stuff. Well, um, well, yeah, um, I gotta say, man, I disagree with you on some things, and I and I I fact checked you briefly, uh, when you talked about the um who the biggest polluter in the world is yeah the u.s government i've heard that that's the military isn't he probably it? Pretty, got it from us i'm pretty sure he's right about that that's what at least I mean, uh, i've seen that statistic many times for many years they just burn a lot of fuel because they're all over the place moving Dude, we've had time. military people call to tell us they were just told to throw shit off the side of the fucking <laughs> aircraft carrier like <laughs> throw a bunch of fucking craftsman tools off the side of this aircraft carrier because we need to order some more with the next budget seriously they I were mean, doing they're, that they're, shit. they're running generators in saudi arabia or iraq to stay 
cool while they have all these military encampments. It Intense. is not an efficient system. We Generators had, to run air conditioners in tents. We had a green a green beret. Dave, you had him on last. I think it was green beret, yeah, right? Yeah, he called uh, it a spending operation, yeah. like spend op. Where what they do is they just fucking load up with thousands upon thousands of rounds of ammunition and just blast them. They just fire and fire and fire and fire, and that's all they do just so they can order more the next time. So, well, yeah. if the government didn't waste thousands of rounds of ammunition, who would do it, Mark? <laughs> <laughs> Who would do it, Ian? No one's sane, because that shit's expensive. Uh, so, Turd, what's your point? What, what were you going to say about that? Well, yeah, I fact-checked it, though. But, um, yeah, according to Google, China, the country of China is the, the world's biggest polluter. So Meaning the government I, of China? Or is that everybody uh, in China? Just everyone in just China collectively is the biggest polluter. I mean, China has something like a billion people. Am I wrong? I don't know if it's I a lot know. of people, but yeah, I, I don't think it's I don't uh, think that's a fair comparison because you're talking about an organization, the military versus China, which is just a landmass. So I don't think you can really compare that's apples to oranges, turd. Well, well, I mean, I don't know. I just hey, I just fact checked it. I just I just typed in what the what the biggest pollutor okay. in the world was. That's what Thanks Google for said. that. Appreciate the I call. Believe- all right, so if, if you do want to call in, we do have the uh, the Discord call-in lines. You will sound great, uh, so feel free to join us there. And also, you could call the regular phone number, which is 603-283-6160. Of course, it's there on your screen as well. Oh, and we are monitoring the chat room, so if you all have a question you want to drop into the Twitch or DLive chats, uh, Danny, I don't know where we were before uh, before Turd called in, so feel yeah, free to pick up wherever. We've kind of been all over the map. <laughs> yeah, we have. Talking it's about, been fun. I think we're talking about whether this system or any system like it can be replicated at scale. I know that I brought up in um, probably one of the debates on my Facebook page that prompted Mark to ask me about this kind of uh, format. Um, I, I brought up this uh, experiment run down in Chile called Galt's Gulch. Um, and, <laughs> you know, that, that failed sp- pretty spectacularly. Sure and I've did. heard a little bit about C seasteading and i appreciate the effort that people have put into something like did you hear what happened project. to those people the seasteaders uh, yeah the the, I, no. the government of thailand put a death sentence on the people who uh just you know put a t- basically a floating tent uh 13 miles out from their country they called it they said no, what did the government I'm say not out, i'm not being a hyperbolic here no. they quite literally said well they, they didn't broke catch a, them did they they didn't know but they put but uh, they could face the death penalty right, if they, they were they've said that they, they've claimed that they are guilty of a crime that the maximum it, punishment of which is the death penalty. The crime was like undermining the sovereignty of, uh, of yeah, Thailand. Some, some ridiculous uh, shits like people camping in the fucking ocean were, <laughs> were undermining <laughs> right. their, their sovereignty. So let me circle the wagons here for just a minute. I, I appreciate some of the more principled and philosophical arguments Ian is making. And I think for a very long time, I was attracted to those arguments and I still think they hold value. At the same time, um, I'm trying to live in the world that we're actually in and asking what 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 are the best outcomes that we've been able to achieve and, and what configurations achieve those outcomes. It would seem to me that a mixed market economy that has a combination of regulated private enterprise and public investments in, in, a, uh, in a public sector um, has produced overall the best outcomes. And they are not perfect outcomes. We, we are not a perfect species and we have not yet devise an infinitely utopian society, but it seems better than all the alternatives that we've experimented with, does it not? Um, I if would... you're comparing all of the, you know, government coercive systems, then yes. But of course, you know, the freedom advocate would say that we haven't really tried freedom, as you've acknowledged, and that that the problem would is, is we don't have, in... yeah, we don't have a control group, and um, the libertarians can always run, and liberals can too. Like I gave you an example that here in the United States, um, you know, uh, surgeries that are uh, elective and must be paid for out of pocket, ha- the quality has gone uh, up and the cost has gone down what do you do you dodge to hey when you're talking about running a medical system for a nation it's the nations that uh, pr- provide right. socialized medicine and I'm, I'm disappointed that you regarded that as a dodge because well, my, my point was only that only mark that um, that those things are fine in isolation but you haven't been able to scale them up to the entire society well, in a way that appears okay right the, the problem is the reason I can't is because 
the 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 massa keep on telling me I'm owned, right? Like they keep there. There's there's no way to try real freedom while the, the I've while told the judges I've opted out, and they just don't care. A monopoly organization <laughs> continues to tell me I must abide by their systems. And you were both highly um, highly influential and thought uh, well thought out and well spoken advocates for your position, but you were outliers on this point because oh, if yeah. you ask most people uh, what they want and you say, well, why don't we just take away Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and you can keep a little bit more of your paycheck and fend for yourself, most people don't actually want that. And most other countries don't want the system of health care the United States has or aspire to have. They like their system much better and want more I think that's probably true. People I, get I the agree government with they you. deserve. Yeah, and, they, and, you know, and, and those want. people have no right to tell me that I must invest in their really crappy retirement system or, um, what did you say, medicine um, – or that I must take the lowest common denominator medical system. And this is the thing that will never be addressed when it comes to medicine is once we have the world's largest economy, um, medical economy, socialized, then will um, medical innovation c- crawl to a stop? Will intellectual property laws and socialized medicine stifle uh, you know what? What we hope to see is human longevity uh, spring forward in the next twenty years. Maybe it won't. Intellectual property laws are definitely stifling uh, innovation. I mean, Socialism no doubt. That's tends, what they were designed to do. Tends to drive towards the mean and tends to drag down the mean. Is that what we want in medicine? Well, I think again, if you look at countries by their average uh, average healthcare outcomes or the average dollar paid for the services rendered, the United States is by far the most expensive system. Yes. We're paying more for the same drugs that other people is in other that countries get for much less. The other right? com- countries are basically offloading their innovation costs on the United States market, which is still the largest. I mean, in well, part. maybe, Mark, but if you see what the average uh, healthcare or pharmaceutical CEO or uh, executives make in a year, and then you look at the system they, they've created, that frankly, the incentives are not aligned. If you took they, every they one make of their money paychecks, by denying care, they you, make money by keeping people sick. They're not actually so interested will the government. in people. They will. The, the government will be uh, incentivized to kill off people who are no longer working and paying taxes. And uh, you know there, there'll be all kinds of misaligned incentives. If you took every CEO's paycheck and every medical uh, you know field out there, and you took it away, and then you applied it to the medical costs, you'd probably see a drop of one dollar right. in everybody's paycheck. I mean, paycheck. you're saying you're saying probably, Mark. But let's actually run this experiment. Let's look at other countries that have socialized or universal health care. Look at their life expectancy. I mean, does Japan have death panels? Does Sweden have death yes, panels? Yes, they do. They have to. The, 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 I'll tell you, uh, the UK certainly does. Uh, we've read stories on multiple occasions. And every government that has to determine, because a resource is scarce, you must, uh, you, you, you have to allocate that resource. So you have to determine on what criteria are you going to allocate that resource. And it could well, be what we cost. know is that the average person consumes at least 50% of their overall medical expenditures in the last six months of their life. Yeah. We know that dying is the expensive. most expensive part of your yes. entire life. Yes. So I'm going to concede to you that there probably are situations in which you look, you know, a family member in the eye and say, you're probably going to get two to three more weeks of life with this person with this really expensive treatment. But is this really the quality of life that this person wants to be having? Have you ever heard of these, any of these stories out of the UK with the, uh, like I have. them I'm deciding familiar to kill with the babies, babies and that shit? was non-viable and there was a lot of debate about Where they wouldn't whether even they let them leave. It. The craziest thing was they wouldn't let them leave to take their own child to Italy, where like for another yeah. socialized wasn't system. The, wasn't the Pope or something going to donate money to? No, it was uh, like the yeah. Prime Minister of Italy. Yeah, yeah. somebody was going to donate to uh, you know have this uh, whatever experimental treatment done, yeah. and the government said no, not because you know they couldn't let the child go. They certainly could, but because it's all about authority. It's all yeah. about we said you can't do this, and we're in charge of you. So I mean, that, that's I, fucked Ian, up. I will say that that is a really powerful anecdote for that particular argument. Yeah. Well, here's another one. There are many people in the United States uh, who commit some low-level criminal offense or just walk into a bank and declare that they're robbing it so that they can be incarcerated to then get the health care that they weren't able sure. to get um, on the outside. <laughs> <laughs> because the health care system in uh, prison in the United States sucks. It's socialist. Right? Well, it They'd be sucks, a lot better off driving 
across the border to, none, to Canada and say, hey, I'm going to none at all. Go ahead. I mean, I, I get it. I get it that, that uh, the prison system probably doesn't have the best health care one could get in America, but it's better health care that you can get if you can afford no health care. Uh, a, a bus ticket to uh, a Greyhound ticket to Canada is cheaper than um, whatever you put in there. I recommend yeah, it that. might be. And, and the individual that I'm citing probably was not uh, engaged in some kind of higher level rational thinking yeah. about uh, medical tourism to other countries. Well, some <laughs> some I, people will commit a crime just so they can get a uh, three hots and a cot during the wintertime. You know, they'll go yeah, to jail sure. for that reason. It's totally rational. And so when we look at why people are in jail, they're in, a, they're in for a range of reasons ranging from mental health to, you know, socioeconomic problems to a variety of issues that have nothing to do with harming individuals or their property, no but for these kinds of problems. So, Danny, um, I think you've got a fine I would, job. I would only say on okay. that last point um, that if we're going to say that the solution to that is to privatize the prison industry to make more profit off of these kinds of problems, I would say that's crazy. No, I, I don't nobody the, here said that. I, I don't have have the best okay. solutions for privatization when it comes to prison. I, I mean, I could, I, I've seen some interesting work. Like I said, in, I'm against privatization. In fiction. The best thing you can do is let people out who've never harmed anybody, like the drug users and the drug dealers and right. the people, you know, prostitutes and all that, and stop yeah. enforcing these insane wars. Yeah, on the best thing I can do is say that you'd probably cut down on crime by somewhere in the neighborhood of 75 to 90 percent if you got rid of, if you stopped incarcerating people for victimless crimes, at least ones that weren't uh, habitualized in that uh, in that uh, capacity, and let out, uh, you know, drug users and you know people, you know, all that kind of stuff. I think you'd see a tremendous drop in crime. But this is the best I can do. Uh, privatization. Privatization just brings cronyism and huge problems with well, corporate. You may not like the term privatization, but I don't know if there's a good uh, free market solution for yeah, locking to, people who are, you know, dangerous. They that's exist. one of those that's one of those tough, uh, you know, issues for a lot of libertarians is trying to say, you know, what would happen in the absence of a coercive state with a so-called justice system that everybody knows is shit. Everybody knows the fucking justice system is garbage if you've ever actually been involved in it, whether it's as a, a civil case or as a criminal case, you know it sucks. Hopefully Danny uh, can fix that a little bit. <laughs> well, I, I would only add here that that I think libertarianism is most attractive when we apply it to a group of capable, responsible, self-sufficient people. Yeah. And if everyone were capable, responsible, and self-sufficient, yeah, we wouldn't need government for very much, if anything at all. Unfortunately, that's not the world we've lived in or ever will live in. And I would argue that government is not something that was imposed upon us, but rather that often just that basic framework of social organization is what people of all societies around the world are compelled to create at any scale so that they can manage their their kind of tribal affairs well what you see is places like uh england is is the richest people there are moving to the islands of uh you know guernsey and jersey and things like that um what i think is going to happen in the united states as well, I, I inevitably believe that these philosophies will take hold because which philosophies uh the, the, the basically you know statism um uh, you know general statism because republicans don't stand against it hard enough and mostly they, they believe in it what's that yeah they, they believe, believe in, it. in it and mostly they're just talking about abortion and women and people using the wrong bathrooms and stuff like that right like that's where their their talking points are all on the social sphere where mm. they can uh you know whip uh, people up they want to employ state force in the directions they want to um i i think these things are inevitable but i also think it's inevitable that well people are going to leave the us and then you're going to have your big earners that as a percentage um, you know, the, the top 10 percent of earners pay the vast majority of income tax and that top 10 percent of them pay an incredible amount. If you lose those huge earners, then you got nothing left. Yeah, this is actually a discussion that we had on my Facebook page, Mark, yes. because we did talk about the matter of. God, I'm uh, glad we're having it here of... because nobody pays attention <laughs> to Facebook. Well, and, and, and then I'm, I'm I'm taking on nine leftists at once and getting called <laughs> oh, names no. and all kinds of oh, other things. No. Well, here you can actually I have a know. conversation. Yeah. You know, I and know. We've been I having know. a good and one I'm here. I'm thrilled to be on your program for that reason. I think no. this is much more an engaging format. This anyway. has really been so interesting, Mark, I, I have to say. I, I would say, Mark, uh, looking at this issue, yeah, there are a small number of people who may be paying 
paying a significant amount in taxes. But we've also seen a great number of examples where they don't, where they have a lot of lawyers and accountants, yeah. and they lobby for the kinds of loopholes that make them pay a much lower. Guess who write the laws? Rate. Right. Well, yeah. here you are, yeah. fucking <laughs> attorneys. Here you are, wishing <laughs> that uh, the government was, uh, you know, a good organization full of honest people again. And I'm going to have to tell you, Danny, it isn't going to happen no matter what. Um, you know, <laughs> right. once once you get your I people. I guarantee you. Anybody who gets elected to the government is probably not an honest person. And if they were when they got there, they'd probably be right. corrupted. So those That's are two facts, Danny. Um, and you can look them up because I know you you shouldn't take anything that I say as fact. You, two facts is, A, the corrupt seek power, and B, those that achieve power tend to become corrupted. So not yeah, only does I, power I, I corrupt, think... but corrupt seek power. And what's going to happen is when you... Uh, somehow, you know, get this magic, uh, you know, future organizational model that you're looking for. The corrupt are going to seek power in it. It's going to be run by assholes. Yeah, it's going to be run by assholes and they're going to rip you off because that's what they do. I think, first of all, we can concede that within each of us, there are probably some better and, and lesser angels. I can also say that, that sure, there are people, uh, dare I say Donald Trump is one of them, who seek power because they have authoritarian, autocratic, or demagogic impulses. I concede that. There are also a great number of people who really do get involved in their, uh, you know, on their school board or on their city council or, you know, in yeah. some other level of government because they really believe in creating a great community. Um, and. And, but you know, I, see, I am not willing to com to paint every gonna, police officer or every um, every politician with the same brush. I, I won't do that either. Individual. But here's what I'll tell you is, is that if you're a good person who wants to do what's right by your neighbor um, in politics, you will likely find very quickly at low levels that you have almost no effect and that in order to be able to rise to the top and, you, you know, to, in order to make money and survive, you need to use the information, at the very least, the infor, the privileged information that you get in order to invest or these sorts of things, and then perhaps a couple of uh, sweetheart deals, and then it's off to the races. I mean, well, let's just say, look, we've minute, even seen the libertarians uh, corrupted here in New Hampshire. You had asked, all the time. You had asked earlier if there was a, new, a libertarian state, and Mark's answer is true. There isn't. However, the libertarians have been elected here in New Hampshire by numbers that the other libertarians elsewhere would be very envious of if they knew about it, uh, but they're running as Republicans and Democrats. And many of those libertarians who are, you know, when we knew them, very principled, you know, good liberty people, some of them have completely, like, gone to the fucking dark side and joined the state, and it is insane, but that's just the, the nature of power. Even the libertarians uh, can't resist. I mean, Ron Paul is one of the few that you could even point to to say, yeah, he managed to resist it, but it's pretty rare that— Well, uh, he still did earmarks. He just didn't vote for his own earmarks because he understood that among 435 people that a vote is basically inconsequential. So therefore, <laughs> um, when you go out but and But it vote, was symbolic, and that made a difference, and that's why yes. he was called Dr. No. But anyway, I just wanted to give you the here's, example. Here's what I will say. I think, I think libertarians uh, with a lowercase l and progressives um, can both suffer from these almost impossible purity tests whereby no candidate— uh, meets their standard for yeah. incorruptibility um, because we live in a complicated world. Clearly, uh, Christians Mark who voted for Trump do not suffer from this <laughs> shit. Well, in many cases, yeah, one yeah. vote or the other is always going to, like, that. for instance, the school board in Keene, you cannot refuse to vote on a thing. And in many cases, when that's just one of the rules. And so in many cases, when a vote comes up, uh, the vote either way is going to increase the size of government. So you've put yourself in this situation that forces somebody to vote for more government. They can't avoid it uh, unless they resign from the position. So there's there are some very awkward positions that people are put into that sort of force them to uh, go against their principles. And that's one of the frustrating things, I think, about uh, pol politics and, and compromise and all that. But to be clear... So, so let me just, let me just yeah. go back for just a second, because Mark talked about power and the, uh, the goal to seek power and the corrupting influence of power. Yes. There's always going to be some measure of power in our society. And the best that we've come up with for a solution to that problem is to distribute that power as widely as possible, because when that power is consolidated, bad things tend to happen. So I would support a system that, that makes that power as, as widely distributed as so possible. So you would agree with uh, secession then? 
Uh, so here's what I would say about secession. If, if, you know, you're not going to have people unwillingly participating in a society if they don't want to. If, if, an organi- if an area of the country wants to secede, my hot take is the United States should probably be divided into about six regional countries. At least. Because it is, it is ungovernable right. um, in, in its current configuration. And that, that actually advances the idea that you're talking about of decentralizing power, bringing decision-making closer to the local level. I mean, I would say six is a minimum. It should be probably more than that. And that way, the people in Texas and Utah can have their red state and the people in California and, uh, you know, Washington and Oregon can have their blue state and let the experiments uh, begin. I think there's the thing about secession and it is two pronged uh, answer I want to give. First of all, I love the idea in some federalist conception of the United States where every state is indeed its own laboratory of innovation and we can see what works or doesn't work in a particular state and adopt that. But the rule is is if you see that things really suck for a long time in a particular state, you have to concede that that is a bad model. So when a state like Kansas runs this experiment where they engage in trickle-down economics and believe that by cutting taxes on everyone, it's just going to create more jobs, that that experiment under the Brownback administration failed miserably, and the idea that Republicans then wanted to replicate that on a national level in 2016 and beyond is a terrible idea. I have the other thing read, I would say, read into on, that as best I can, and I cannot – uh, like I, I just cannot discern what the problems were, but at the same time, I just throw back Detroit in your face and say, "Hey, look, socialism's <laughs> working real good over there." Go ahead. I, I don't think Detroit is a model for socialism. I think what they happened certainly thought in a they place... were at one point. <laughs> well, I, I think we could talk about these are the just auto models for statism. In Detroit and That's why Detroit's um, manufacturing sector went away when that was its principal uh, economic output. But let me just say, going back a minute now, that the only way that those those laboratories of innovation, whether we're calling them states or countries, work is if we have immigration laws that allow people to enter and leave Absolutely. freely. And I think Absolutely. I think good libertarians get that issue, and it frustrates me when people call themselves libertarian, but they want oh, a man. police state at the border. I yeah, don't get totally that. Totally frustrates the shit out of me. Those people do not yeah. understand freedom. Yeah, I'm not going to take the time to explain why I agree, but uh, I agree. Danny, yeah, uh, we're the, we, uh, we have the fun, uh, the fun role of being the libertarian who totally get immigration and freedom <laughs> and being on national radio where both the fucking Republicans well, and the Democrats yeah. listening cannot comprehend it. Well, we're yeah. on both re- uh, liberal and conservative stations. We are. As many liberal stations as there are left. I um, mean, we're basically the only live content out there for them from which they can choose that is less distasteful than uh, the Republicans. Right. And yeah, we're so carried on a bunch of progressive talkers. These the days. reason, yeah, that's the reason that we tend to be there and we, we get it from all sides, uh, especially on the immigration issue. Danny, I'm going to... This has been good. This yeah, attempt to wrap this up yeah. by giving you mm-hmm. the opportunity of... I'm going to ask the final question. Um, Danny, could you just give me a short, uh, you know, soliloquy on why it is that you turned away from the, the most moral and just belief <laughs> system in the world <laughs> to the obvious godless commie crap you believe now? By the way, yeah. uh, you've always, many of the things you've stated here sound to me like uh, you, are, you I would describe you as a consequence Sequentialist left libertarian. I would not pull the title from you. I know Ian will. Go he ahead. said he's against violence earlier, so hey, you know, I'm on board with that. Yeah, I, I like that description, Mark. Uh, if I can get that on a T-shirt, I would wear that. <laughs> that's fine. Well, that'll, um, that'll make you popular with the ladies. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure. Um, so as long as they have strong reading glasses to get all of those words on a T-shirt, I'm not a big guy, so it'd be a small print. Um, So, okay, look, I I think that libertarian ideas are attractive, and I see a lot of people go through at least a phase whereby they see the value of those ideas, and we've talked about that extensively. There are also plenty of problems with government, all right? We've talked about things like waste, fraud, abuse, coercion, um, violence. Those Those are issues that we need to deal with. But the reality is government is not going away. We're going to have some form of government next year and, you know, 10 years from now, et cetera. We should be willing to engage in a discussion, not merely about big or small government, but what we want our government to do. What do we want our government to do for us? What are we going to invest in um, so that we can have the kind of future that's desirable? And there are probably many areas of government that, that progressives and libertarians can agree we should be defunding. Um, and I think the remaining questions are, you know, what do we do to further the outcomes that we all agree we want, which are like smart, healthy people living dignified, meaningful lives. 
Now, Ian, I want to let his, I want to let his statement stand. No, I, I have a qu another question that has uh, nothing to do uh, with politics, Mark. Well, uh, well, uh, all I'm I, I'm wondering at this point by letting the, the the statement stand, have we now endorsed leftism? Because no. you know the people out there we spent uh, an hour and a half the, talking about these. The people things. That <laughs> out there that hated on us for letting Cantwell on the hated on you specifically for letting Cantwell on the air. Here I have I've brought on a leftist to uh, talk about his stuff, and I've given him the final word. Well, that fine. Is, ask your let them people question. what let people think what they want to think. Just for um, those people. Yeah, fuck the haters. I don't give a shit. Anyway, uh, Danny, thanks for coming on with us. Uh, you mentioned that you're working on being an attorney. That's something that you're focusing on in life. Of course, you've been a talented... I'm going to law school. I'm not confident that I will yet be a practicing attorney, but the law is an area that I want to focus on, for sure. Right on. We actually have a co-host on Monday nights, Melanie, who went to law school and is not an attorney. She's doing other things. We have another co-host who went to law school and is an attorney. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we do, uh, as a matter of fact. Does Laurel so, still count as a co-host? She hasn't been on recently. She's taken a, a break, but uh, anyway, so what I wanted to ask you about was you're obviously, you know, we refer to you lovingly as the producer of Playing Columbine, the movie that you had us in uh, for part of an interview. Are you still doing media production? Uh, and if so, is there a project that you want to promote uh, tonight? I mean, people are welcome to um, visit my website, emberwildproductions.com, or just Google me, Danny Ladoni. I'm easy to find. Um, I really enjoy, at this point, um, guiding other people on their own um, media production goals. So um, I'm offering an opportunity for people to learn about podcasting and create their own podcast. I think it's a great format, and I think formats like this are excellent for the same reason. Um, so, you know, thank you guys for having me on, and I hope I've thrown some arguments your way that give people you know some some pause and some things to think about and uh, I hope we can continue conversations like this the uh, I, I was on the Oracle of bacon dot org uh, dot, dot oh, yeah. org or com site. What is this uh, this is the site that uh, you know, <laughs> definitive site that uh, determines whether or not you are within degrees of Kevin Bacon okay. and they have taken away the documentary click box which was the one by which I became three it always had three, although at one point it showed two degrees uh, to Kevin Bacon, um, and I can't remember, you know, who it was. I think it might have been through what was the guy's name that hung up on us? I don't know. Look, he, well, we just oh, talked about, about Jack Thompson. Jack oh. Thompson. Yeah, Jack, <laughs> yeah I think it was through hard attorney who wanted to censor video <laughs> games and police the industry. Yeah, I, I think it was actually through him. But now I, I guess I'm since the Oracle of Bacon doesn't say it anymore. I guess I'm no longer uh, two degrees. So you from, lost from a degree? I, I've lost it. I've lost it. Yeah, I, yeah, and I, I've fallen from grace in a similar manner, Mark, so don't feel too bad. Yeah. Look, I would only say, I, I thought of this just now, um, I have been a plaintiff in two lawsuits, uh, and both of those times I was suing the government. So um, <laughs> I I will leave that as my claim to fame. I, I certainly think that, uh, that we need very vigorous um, and vigilant citizens to challenge government power. Government, without question, is the, is the chief source of power in our society. They have a monopoly on violence, and for that reason, we should be extra judicious about, you know, calling them out and being willing to stand up to and question their decisions when necessary. Totally agree. Danny thank Ladone, you. thank you for joining us here on Freer Talk Live. Have a great night. It's a pleasure. Take yes, care. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, check him out. It's L-E-D-O-N-N-E. -N -N -E. That's Danny Ladone. Anything else you want to share tonight, Mark, on our Freer Talk Live after show? No, I'm just kind of trying to think now. I think this was a highly successful. Yeah, he's great. Probably, smart guy. Um, you know, in large part to the fact that Danny's good at this and not scared of a mic.